side. Thanks very much indeed, and hello. If I represent the strengths of the House of Lords, let me very quickly say that I represent the weaknesses of the House of Lords. I'm white, I'm old, and I'm male. Um, as introduced as chairman of committees, that's true, and the chairman says in the, the description of the job that the chairman of committees chairs all committees in the House of Lords except where the House decides otherwise. Fortunately, the House frequently decides otherwise, but it does mean that I'm left with chairing about a dozen or so uh, committees. So what I want to talk about today uh, is to describe the range and activity of the select committees of the House of Lords and how they contribute to the three primary functions of the House, which are scrutinising legislation, holding the executive to account, and providing a forum for informed public debate on matters of public interest and policy. Now, during the time I'm speaking, what I'd like you to sort of bear in mind, sort of as a background question, is does the non-elected composition of the House of Lords enhance or diminish the effectiveness of its select committees? And that is perhaps a topic that we could return to um, during the question and answer session. There are three broad categories of select committees. Legislative committees, which consider primary and secondary legislation, and undertake both pre- and post-legislative scrutiny. Investigative committees, which focus on a particular topic of public policy, and domestic committees, which consider member services, the administration of the House, and matters of governance and discipline. And although I spend most of my time working with the domestic committees and indeed chairing all of them, it is the impact on public policy of the legislative and investigative committees that I shall be concentrating on in this lecture. Now I chair, one of the committees I chair is the House of Lords Liaison Committee, which regularly reviews the work of all the select committees and indeed before I took up my present post I used to chair one of the EU subcommittees on agriculture, fisheries and the environment and served on various other select committees including one on the famous or infamous uh, Barnet formula. Now each uh, of our select committees tends to have around uh, 13 members and there is sort of political balance we faced a problem with the setting up of the coalition government, how in fact the numerical composition in the Commons would be reflected broadly in terms of composition in the House of Lords. And it was agreed at that stage in 2010 that the government would not have a majority over the other parties and cross benches on any <coughs> committee or subcommittee. Now, how do you get on? to a, a select committee where well, members are formally selected by a body called the Committee of Selection. And that is primarily on the nomination of the chief whips and the convener of the cross benches. And then that reference goes to the, to the chamber itself which makes the appointment. It is perhaps interesting that, that the parties tend to adopt different approaches to selecting uh, their members. Um, in one, at least one case, the party, the party tends to hold elections for particularly important or uh, interesting uh, select committees. Other, another party I know, sort of really seeks to get a, a sort of an expression of interest and expertise um, for uh, of members who want to to serve on a particular committee and uh, possibly, possibly I say this uh, 
quietly, possibly in one case, it may be that the chief of the party um, would use uh, the ability to appoint members of committees uh, perhaps as a reward or even possibly a punishment. Um, what we are doing is to sort of in trying to improve the, the representativeness of our committees within, within the House. So my job is to really prod the chief whips uh, to make sure that we get a reasonable selection of women, of people with disabilities, of people uh, from uh, minority uh, communities, and also to enable uh, new up peers who have just come into the House to start making a contribution to the work of the House uh, through the Select Committee procedure, which I think, in a way, is a very good introduction to the House of Lords because it actually means that you're getting on doing a pretty big substantial piece of work and working with a group of colleagues from uh, all sides uh, of the House itself. The House of Lords committees have some well-known and highly respected experts amongst its members. For example, we've got uh, Lord Winston, Robert Winston, esteemed doctor, scientist, uh, television commentator, polymath and just about everything else. Uh, he is a member of the Science and Technology Committee. We've got former European commissioners and MEPs, including Christopher Tugendhat and Lyndon Harrison. They scrutinize EU proposals as members of our EU committee. Nigel Lawson, I don't know if anybody can remember Nigel Lawson now. <laughs> Nigel Lawson, a former <coughs> Chancellor of the Exchequer, serves on our Economic Affairs Committee. And Sheila Noakes, who has a distinguished or has distinguished careers, not a single career, has distinguished careers in both public and private sector finance and was formerly a non-executive director of the Court of the Bank of England, recently chaired our ad hoc committee considering personal services tax companies. Committees, different types of committees tend to select their topics for inquiries in different ways. Pre- and post-legislative uh, scrutiny topics at the moment tend to be proposed by the government itself. And perhaps this is something that in the future we may sort of return to and discuss whether um, the selection of pre- and post-legislative topics should <coughs> rest purely and solely uh, with the government at the time. For other committees, um, the uh, uh, the ad hoc committees, in members of the House of Commons, we write to them and we, we ask them to propose topics that are worthy uh, of being looked at by an ad hoc committee. They um, reply and the liaison committee, uh, whose function it is to allocate resources to the select committees, sort of discusses them, we identify a short list, we work up proposals and then uh, come to a decision on which topics we think uh, are, are really uh, very strong candidates uh, for uh, the select committee proposal. In fact, just what, what is it, Chris, about this month? This month. This month, we're circulating through the internal uh, magazine um, the request for members to identify topics that we will look at um, once the general election is out of the way. So that process for the next parliament is already underway. Sessional committees um, undertake a mix of uh, follow-up and uh, new thematic inquiries. They are supported by their full-time staff in scoping out possible topics for inquiries, often using agreed criteria for selection and put together their own work programme. So the sessional committees tend to have a continuing existence and have a clear work programme stretching into the future. Almost all Lords committees undertake inquiries. Once a committee has selected a topic for inquiry, a call for evidence is issued, asking any interested people in, or organisations for their views or information in writing. We flag these inquiries to relevant stakeholders and you can sign up 
or email alerts to be notified about the work of committees, such as the launch of a new inquiry on their website. Committees then hold evidence sessions with witnesses. And I should clarify, although we use sort of the, the legal terminology of evidence um, uh, sessions and witnesses, um, it isn't really that sort of process. Uh, and it certainly isn't as sort of competitive and, um, um, as, the, as some of the uh, select committees in the House of Lords, especially if you see the bits that are broadcast on television. All these meetings are in public, they're webcast, and some are shown on BBC uh, Parliament. One of the, the good things is that if you're on one of these committees, uh, people, distinguished people, real authorities in their area, are very are usually very, very happy to come along and give evidence to select committees. They, because it's in their interest to get their point of view across and to be taken into account in the policy-making uh, process. So you really get people who are leading experts in their own area of knowledge who come along and give us the benefit of their, their, their evidence. I should also mention that we, we take uh, evidence from government during inquiries, and most departments uh, adopt a very constructive and professional uh, relationship with the committees, giving full uh, cooperation in a very constructive manner. And after all, that is also uh, has an advantage to them. Um, I do say, you know, I will depart from the sanitised version of my script here. I, I do say that there are interesting ways in which government departments differ in how they approach select committees. The, 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 the Foreign and Commonwealth Office actually almost um, smothers you with kindness. They are, they are very, very attentive on the needs of select committees, are usually prepared to come along and give briefings on very complex matters of foreign policy at very short notice. And they, the Foreign Office tends to have a very close and positive relationship uh, with our EU subcommittee on foreign affairs. I do have to say, that uh, the Treasury, however, adopts a somewhat different um, uh, approach and really is prepared to use any bankrupt argument to avoid coming in contact uh, with a select committee and putting their old, poor old departmental ministers uh, in the firing uh, line. Committees can also sort of choose uh, to go out get away from Westminster and, and Whitehall and uh, look for evidence where it is could most likely be more relevantly collected, collected. For example, last week the Economic Affairs Committee took evidence in Manchester as part of its inquiry into the economic case for HS2. And when I was... Um, chair of the EU Agriculture Committee, I unfortunately had the, the odorous, totally odorous duty of chairing an inquiry into the EU wine regime, which uh, involved a bit of very hard, difficult and prolonged field work. <laughs> uh, the video clip we're about to play actually gives you a, f a flavour of one of these, of these visits. Transport links from around the country um, to see what's happening here and 
to see that the legacy of London 2012 is going to live on for decades to come. The test for the end of legacy is whether it's going to be possible to create long-term sustainable communities, uh, long-term sustainable jobs. Now, we're not going to be able to tell that just by looking through and having a look as we are today, but it helps us get a better idea than simply giving formal evidences. So if people say to you, do you think the Olympics was a good thing or a bad thing or just so-so 50-50, what would you say? Why? 50-50, why is it a good thing? When you get the papers, the select committee papers, and you sit in a committee and you, you read about what it is, it cannot compare to actually seeing what has been delivered on the ground. You don't get a feel for what it's going to be like until you see it. Uh, you know, however many drawings you see, however many pictures you, you see, until you walk through it, you don't get that uh, sense of what's going to happen. Okay, well that gives you a taste. Uh, okay, that gives you a taste of uh, what a committee visit is is all about. Now, after hearing from experts and interested parties, committees meet in private uh, to consider emerging themes and to consider uh, possible conclusions. A draft report is then considered and agreed, almost always by consensus rather than vote. And then the government has eight weeks in which to respond. Now, these reports are often debated in the Lords, but they are also discussed with interested stakeholder groups, for example, through post-publication seminars. We get a reasonable amount of uh, press interest in Lords' reports, and uh, I mean they often figure on the Radio 4 uh, Today programme. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Both the House of Lords and the House of Commons have their own structure of select committees and there are significant differences. The Lords has made a deliberate effort to complement rather than duplicate the work of the Commons committees. In the Commons, each government department has a select committee which shadows and monitors their activities. While in the Lords, the approach is deliberately uh, more thematic than cross-cutting. To take a recent example, the Lord's Select Committee on Public Service and Demographic Change looked at the implications of an ageing society in an integrated manner, thinking about how that affected health, housing, employment, the demand for public expenditure generally, and across the whole range of public services. And this, I think, actually makes more sense than looking at a narrowly focused departmental uh, perspective, because after all, we, we don't live our lives in sort of government departmental boxes. Uh, we live them in a, hopefully, in a more integrated and realistic uh, way. To take another example, the Commons has a long established and permanent foreign affairs committee. While the Lords has shied away from that and instead has constituted short-term ad hoc committees um, from year to year uh, to look at what could generally be called a foreign affairs uh, theme, uh, but not set up a permanent, one permanent uh, committee. But sort of the themes have varied. We've recently uh, examined the role of soft power in the pursuit of foreign policy. Um, we currently have a, a, an ad hoc select committee looking at the Arctic uh, and bringing together concerns about the environment, uh, energy, uh, defence issues and indeed new safety issues as the, the, the northern waters are opened up to uh, commercial uh, traffic. Similarly, the Commons has a Treasury Select Committee which examines the expenditure, administration and policy 
of Her Majesty's Treasury, HM Revenue and Customs, and associated public bodies. While the Lords has an Economic Affairs Committee, which is charged with, in the quotation, considering economic affairs in the round. Quite, quite a, a, a modest task, you may think. <laughs> Um, this gives it wide scope to consider important issues such as the economic case for HS2, the economic impact on energy policy of shale, gas and oil, and uh, tackling corporate tax avoidance in a global economy. This sort of cro these cross -cutting, this cross-cutting themes approach has in recent years led to to us developing a program of work based upon single session ad hoc collect, select committees. These committees have, in addition, considered diverse topics, including the legacy of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, and you saw a quick clip of them at work, HIV and AIDS in the UK, and exports by small and medium sized enterprises. So you have a full range and variety of topics that are covered by these uh, ad hoc select committees. Although the two houses are independent, they have the ability to establish joint committees <coughs> and some of the most influential select committees in Parliament, such as the Select Committee on Human Rights, whose work has been the basis of critical debate on successive pieces of anti-terrorism legislation are joint committees of both houses and one of our blockbuster joint committees set up in 2012 was our joint banking commission which considered professional standards and the culture of the UK banking sector taking account of regulatory and competition investigations into the LIBOR rate setting uh, scandal and lessons to be learned about corporate governance, transparency and conflicts of interest and their implications for regulation and for government. Now the House of Lords was actually able uh, to um, field uh, some pretty hard hitters on that, uh, on that debate, including uh, the present Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, who made I think one of the most sustained and high quality contributions to the way that uh, committee developed and also two others who may be less well known, Baroness Kramer and Lord Turnbull, who perhaps has the greatest, the greatest knowledge of regulation in the, the banking and financial sectors of anybody in the country. Although the ad hoc investigative committees <coughs> take evidence, deliberate, report and dissolve at the end of a single session, the sessional committees are reappointed every session. That raises a problem. You don't want the same people sitting on the same committee session after session. And so we have a, a, a turnover, a rotation rule, which does in fact provide for a degree of turnover. We require that members are rotated off a sessional committee after three sessions, and that's usually three years, and does not allow for reappointment to the committee or any of its subcommittees for two years. That's caused a bit of difficulty, uh, particularly with our uh, EU committees, um, where the, the little trick was to move from one subcommittee to the other subcommittee and back again. Uh, that, has, that sort of uh, loophole has now been closed. And the rotation principle is, is there as an attempt to secure a degree of continuity while enabling the expertise of the committee to be refreshed and also as a way of providing an opportunity for newly created peers with relevant experience and knowledge to contribute. We always have the, the danger that um, we are a house, I suppose, of experts or former experts, but as we get old, we be and older and older, our expertise is based, tends to be based on things that happened 10, 20, 30 years ago. There is a map. We have to have that expertise refreshed by current knowledge and learning. Perhaps special mention should be made of the European Union Committee and its six subcommittees. The Lords devotes a high level 
of human and financial resource, around 74 members, 24 staff and considerable financial resource, to scrutinising proposed European legislation and the UK government's response. In recent years, uh, that committee has been influential in influencing the direction and details of EU policy. In July 2014, it reported on the right to be forgotten, concluding that it was unworkable, unreasonable and wrong in principle, and thus having the temerity to disagree with a major judgment of the European Court of Justice. The report is well known and continues to be cited widely in the media. It is now a prominent voice in the continuing council negotiations on the proposed data protection regulation. That committee's 2008 report on reform of the common fisheries policy recommended a decentralization of decision making and the introduction of a ban on the discarding of edible fish. Regulations to reform that much maligned area of EU policy were adopted in January in a, and in October of this year, the first results of the new regionalised common fisheries policies came through. Member states working together in the different regional seas, the North Sea, the Baltic Sea, and much more, in much more difficult is the Mediterranean, came up with their own plans as how to manage the implementation of the discard ban rather than a plan which was sort of top-down imposed from Brussels. Indeed, the trick that we thought had to be played was to ensure compliance and that the compliance was best achieved through getting a buying and a local sense of shared ownership and responsibility. It's a difficult route to go but in the long term, we were convinced that that was the most effective way of getting uh, individual fishermen to sign up to a sensible and rational uh, fisheries policy. The extensive subcommittee structure produces a powerful combination of peers, some who have extensive knowledge of the working of the Commission and the European Parliament, in other words, political nous, together with peers who have expert knowledge of particular policy areas. Melding the two together gives you a very strong basis for producing a credible uh, report. In October 2014, the outgoing EU Commission President, uh, José Manuel Barroso, singled out the House of Lords from other EU national parliaments for the excellence of its EU reports. And indeed, we frequently get members of uh, uh, EU committees from other parliaments coming over and discussing with us how they can strengthen their parliamentary um, scrutiny of EU uh, legislation. Last year, a former <coughs> minister, Chris Bryant, told the Commons European Scrutiny Committee, which acts on a completely different basis, that appearing before the quotation is, the House of Lords Committee was far more rigorous, embarrassing, nerve-wracking and detailed than being before the Commons Committee. So we take some uh, quite satisfaction in that. <laughs> I want to turn to some examples of where recent work by the House of Lords Committee has, committees that has had a real impact. In other words, to answer the sort of so what question. What do you get at the end of it? One such example is the Science and Technology Committee's inquiry into nuclear research and development in 2010-12, which helped spur the government into taking action to address long-term planning for the UK's nuclear energy. The key recommendation from the Science and Technology Committee's 2013 inquiry into scientific infrastructure, the need for a long-term strategic plan for science capital investment was accepted by the government and is now being implemented. Another topical example is in response to a recommendation 
from the Communications Committee, the Director of Public Prosecutions has clarified prosecution guidelines on criminal offences committed using social media, so-called revenge porn. In 2009, the Constitution Committee published a report on fast-track legislation, legislation that proceeds through Parliament more quickly than usual and often in a, an environment of emergency. Uh, and therefore, I think has to be justified very uh, carefully. The committee recommended that when the government seeks to fast track a bill, they should have to set out the case for doing so. This should include stating why each element of the bill needs to be fast tracked, what steps they have taken to ensure that outside groups and interested parties have had an opportunity to comment on the policy, and whether appropriate safeguards and mechanisms for post-legislative scrutiny are included in the bill. As a result, the government now includes a statement on the issues set out by the committee in the explanatory notes to fast-track bills. The most recent example uh, coming to mind is the Counter-Terrorism and Security Bill introduced into the House of Commons just last week. Last year, the Ad Hoc Committee on the Olympic and Paralympic Legacy called for UK sports no compromise approach to funding elite sports to be reviewed with a view to less of an exclusive focus on sports which were already yielding high numbers of medals at major events. This approach had supported unprecedentedly good performances in the short term and outstanding results at London 2012. In the longer term, it was found to be harming team sports, which had obvious social and participation value, but yielded fewer medals per athlete and hindering the development of sports which had not had recent success. I think it's often said that we do very well in the UK in sports where you sit down, uh, horse riding and uh, rowing. And they, those sports tend to have a slightly different social profile to football and netball and games, uh, sports like that. In early 2014, <coughs> UK Sport rejected the call to review its approach, but the Lord Select Committee's recommendations snowballed throughout the year and played a part in UK Sport announcing in October 2014 that they would indeed carry out a review. The 2011 report of the Ad Hoc Committee on HIV AIDS in the United Kingdom led to the introduction of free testing of migrants for HIV. Earlier this year, the Ad Hoc Committee on, Men on the Mental Capacity Act of 2005 got widespread media coverage and shed a spotlight on the operation of the Act, finding that vulnerable adults were being failed by an Act designed to protect and empower them. And I think this is a really important recent uh, contribution because originally um, the government and many other agencies had thought that the Act was working well and really didn't need revision. It's interesting that the view taken of that Act has now changed uh, completely because the inquiry found that social workers, healthcare professionals and others involved in the care of vulnerable adults were not aware of the Act not aware of the provisions of the Act and were failing to implement it. The committee's main recommendation was that an independent oversight body be established to oversee how the Act was working in, pro in process. Although we do not yet know the detail, the government has accepted the need for some sort of independent oversight and hopefully this might make a real difference to people's lives and achieve the original objectives of the Act. It's always satisfying to be able to point to specific examples of parliamentary effectiveness, but more often than not, the impact of committees is more nuanced and change is achieved over a period of years 
or as part of a wider debate. Constitutional arrangements for the use of armed force, what anyone else might describe as going to war, is a good example of that. The Lord's Constitution Commission Committee first considered this subject in 2005-2006. It recommended then that there should be a parliamentary convention governing the role of Parliament in decisions to deploy armed force overseas with the government seeking parliamentary approval for such action. Since then, there have been suggestions that Parliament's role should be formalised, either through a resolution or through legislation. Meanwhile, a vote approving the use of British armed forces over Libya took place in March 2011, and in 2013-14 session, the committee undertook a follow-up inquiry at a time when military assistance to anti-government forces in Syria was being discussed, but it was unclear what role the House of Commons would play in any such process. The committee concluded that the current convention, whereby, and other than in times of exceptional circumstances, a debate and vote is held in the House of Commons on the deployment of armed force overseas was the best arrangement. During the debate on the report in the House of Lords, the Minister stated the Government's commitment to respect the existing parliamentary convention and said that they were reflecting on whether any further formalisation was needed. The Committee's report also examined the Government's internal arrangements for deciding on the use of force. We concluded that the Cabinet should remain the ultimate decision maker on whether to use armed force overseas. We found that many of the government's internal arrangements in this area were poorly understood and so recommended that they be set out in detail in the next edition of the Cabinet Manual. In their written response, the government agreed with the committee on both points. Since the report was published, the House of Commons debate on military intervention in Syria on the 29th of August 2013 reinforced the convention that the House of Commons is consulted before the deployment of UK armed forces overseas. The Prime Minister immediately accepted the House's vote against intervention, saying the British Parliament, reflecting the views of the British people, does not want to see British military action. I get that, and the government will act accordingly. Our committees produce high-quality reports that contribute to debate on current and emerging policy areas. They often receive a high level of, me of media attention on publication. But we're still working out how best to ensure all members of the House of Lords engage with these reports and are aware of their content, as actual debates in the Lords on them can uh, be somewhat disappointing sometimes only involving members of the committee with just a limited number of other peers taking part and including the responsible minister and front bench spokesman from the main uh, opposition parties. Our sessional committees have the advantage of being able to revisit previous work to ensure recommendations have been considered seriously. For example, our science and technology committee regularly revisited a report on radioactive waste management over a period of several years until it was satisfied that the government was taking action. In contrast, we are still learning how best to do follow-up of the ad hoc committees because the ad hoc committees ceased to exist after the session in which they've been doing their work. The sessional committees carry on, but the ad hocs disappear. One novel approach was pioneered by the small and medium-sized enterprise export committee which asked for a second government uh, response on key points one year after the first report. Similarly, the report of the committee chaired by Lord Filking, uh, Ready for Aging, also received a second government report to see how much progress had been done in meeting the recommendations of the report during a, a full year. 
but we're still learning how to do better follow-up. And the, <clears throat> one of the difficulties is that we lose the sort of the links that staff have built up with the various interest groups once the once the, the, the committee is is dissolved, and the committee members themselves seem tend to go off and become involved in 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 other things. That's not one of the allows. <laughs> pre legislative scrutiny, where members looking detail at draft bills before they are introduced into Parliament, can be some of the most productive scrutiny of all. Although in fairness, I should point out that on occasion, setting up a draft bill committee, uh, pre-legislative draft bill committee, can be used as the parliamentary equivalent of kicking something into the long grass, especially if it's a, a difficult area of policy. The example that comes to mind is that long-running issue of uh, uh, prisoner voting rights, uh, where uh, it's now being discovered, be it dis uh, considered by a joint uh, select committee of both houses, not expected to report this side of the general election. A positive topical example uh, is last session's Joint Committee on the Draft Modern Slavery Bill. Major recommendations which were accepted by the government in the first instance were the introduction of a statutory defence for victims of slavery and an extension to the role and independence of the proposed anti-slavery commissioner, as well as establishing a scheme of advocates for child victims of trafficking. A significant area where the government did not accept the Joint Committee's recommendation was imposing a statutory requirement on companies which provide services in the UK to prepare statements over the absence of slavery from their supply chains, based on the California Transparency in Supply Chains Act. There has been an extended campaign on this, and the government has since largely backed down and introduced amendments in the Commons. Some of the remaining rejected recommendations are now likely to be major issues during the House of Lords consideration. For example, the creation of specific offences for child exploitation or reversing changes made to the immigration rules in 2012, which removed the ability of overseas domestic workers to change their employers and remain in the UK. In short, the bill now before Parliament, and it's going through its committee stages almost as we speak in the House of Lords, uh, is better drafted than it was. Uh, and that's important, and the debates on it better informed because of the committee's work. That's easy to say, but I've sat through a number of hours as, the, as this bill has gone through its stages in the House of Lords. And the fact that it has had a period of pre-legislative scrutiny uh, is, has very significantly affected the quality of debate and indeed affected the relationship between government and those who, who disagree with it. And there's been a much more constructive atmosphere on that bill than there are on, on many others. As I come to conclude, I want to go back to that list of core functions of the House and think about how the committee work fits into it. The House of Lords does not make or break governments, unlike the Commons. So holding the executive to account at a high level will always be weaker than some, than some work that can be done by the House of Commons. But our committees tend to be much stronger at the detailed level and much more uh, persistent. We have the time to undertake detailed analysis, coupled with broad experience and expertise which can be brought to bear. Our present ad hoc committee considering affordable childcare is a, a good example of how you can get a mix of both people who are aware of the policy area and also people who have expertise on the, if you like, the craft of politics. And that is an area uh, which I think is likely to loom large uh, in coming months uh, and uh, as we go through the general election period and, and thereafter. When it comes to scrutinising legislation, our EU committee works tirelessly to scrutinise every single legislative proposal coming out of Brussels. 
Our Delegated Powers Committee ensure government does not give itself too much power to act without reference back to Parliament. And our Joint Committee on Human Rights and our Constitution Committee undertake line-by-line -line scrutiny of all UK legislation, lagging up where there is a human rights consideration or where, indeed, it ra legislation raises significant issues of constitutional concern. Finally, when it comes to providing a forum to inform public debate, the House of Lords, I would suggest, does very well indeed. The nature of the membership and the non-partisan approach to committee work, and you, I think you genuinely have difficulty, if you look in on a House of Lords Select Committee, you have quite a lot of difficulty of spotting where the party lines are drawn. They do act they, they, in a very strong non-partisan way. And also we have the range and depth of experience that perhaps the Commons doesn't always have. It does mean that our committees can produce world-class reports that do make a difference and certainly provoke debate. There are still lessons we need to learn. We can't be complacent. I've pointed to some of the challenges already, but I think I've most likely said uh, enough now. This is a dialogue. It's an open uh, lecture. So it's really up to you. I don't know whether you've had any experience of either watching our select committees or, or interfacing with them at all. Questions are, you know, have you got anything to say, suggestions with them? as we try and improve follow-up to make sure that the work that is done it really does have a chance of bringing forward real, real outputs and real, real change. And indeed, how should committees operate in the 21st century? And perhaps, from your point of view, what do you think are the big issues that select committees ought to be looking at in the coming months and years? So it's over to you. Thank you very much.